Managers of Japan's nuclear plants are getting ready for a new reality. Regulators have been working on strengthening safety standards ever since the 2011 accident in Fukushima. The changes take effect next month, and already people are questioning how tough the rules will be to put into practice. NHK World's Hajime Okada walks us through some of the issues in today's Nuclear Watch. Nuclear regulators spent nine months drawing up the new requirements. They revised the rules following the 2011 accident at the Fukushima Daiichi. An earthquake and tsunami triggered meltdowns in three reactors at the plant. The new requirements oblige plant operators to implement a number of measures. Operators must prepare for the highest predicted tsunami wave. They have to set up breakwaters and take other precautions to prevent seawater from entering facilities. A loss of power triggered the meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi. The new requirements oblige operators to upgrade backup power systems. In addition, they have to build alternative control rooms. And they have to install filter vents that will remove radioactive substances when engineers release pressure in containment vessels to prevent explosions. We aimed to make requirements that are the most stringent when compared to international standards. But a closer look reveals potential problems. Regulators will face obstacles in determining whether operators are meeting the new requirements. One issue involves electric cabling. A dense network of cables snakes through nuclear plants. It serves a number of functions from power supply to risk control. One reactor needs 2,000 kilometers of cable. Nearly 40 years ago, a fire at the U.S. nuclear plant exposed the vulnerability of these cables. Flames burned for eight hours, ruining cables and knocking out the reactor cooling system. Japanese regulators say they recognize the importance of fireproofing. A fire could be a major cause of a meltdown. No shit. Fire prevention measures need to be stepped up. The new requirements call for the use of special cables that don't catch fire easily. They also allow utilities to coat ordinary cables with fire retardant materials. This method is in practice at 13 of Japan's 50 nuclear reactors. Operators say fire retardant cables or cables coated in fire retardant material are equally effective. An expert we spoke to disagrees. Sections with thin fire retardant coatings are less resistant to fire. Those sections are highly likely to get damaged early on. We asked experts to conduct tests to determine the difference coating sickness makes. The experts compared coatings that are more than 1.5 millimeters thick to ones that are less than 1 millimeter thick. The experts burned the cables for 20 minutes. After six minutes, fire engulfed the cables with the one millimeter thick coating. It happened with a number of samples. It's evident thinly coated cables burn easily. You're going to need a bigger boat. And so, plant operators need to examine the thickness of fire retardant coatings on cables to determine the effectiveness of fireproofing. Regulators haven't specified how they will verify the performances of cable networks at nuclear plants. Oh my God. 
Some say similar problems remain with other equipment and facilities. Checking not only cables, but all the equipment would be extremely difficult. Inspecting plants to verify safety is a colossal challenge. There are 50 nuclear reactors in Japan. Monitoring all those reactors isn't going to be easy. Sometimes I just think funny things. <laughs> it may even prove impossible. So all I'm saying is if anybody thinks that they're not going to screw you, well, good for you. The Nuclear Regulation Authority has 80 inspectors. They likely need more manpower and more expertise. Researchers have been analyzing data about Fukushima Daiichi from every angle they can think of. Now, a team of Japanese and U.S. scientists have created a map showing how one radioactive substance spread after the accident. The researchers used data collected by aircraft. Their map illustrates the spread of iodine-131, which can cause cancer. The red section indicates areas most heavily contaminated three weeks after the accident. The map also illustrates how the iodine spread to the northwest. Iodine has half-life about eight days. Up until now, researchers had not been able to accurately calculate how much had leaked and how far it has spread. Health authorities are conducting periodic checks of people from Fukushima who were 18 and under at the time of the accident. What the fuck? You Workers in Western Japan have been unloading containers carrying nuclear fuel. So all I'm saying is if anybody thinks that they're not going to screw you, well, good for you. It's the first shipment to arrive in the country in more than two years since the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. The fuel came from France and is bound for the Takahama power plant of the Sea of Japan coast. It's a mixture of reprocessed uranium and plutonium called MOX. What the fuck? You the same type of fuel had powered four Japanese reactors, but those facilities were idled after the nuclear disaster. The operator of the Takahama plant wants to use the fuel in one reactor. It's still offline, but officials say they'll seek permission to resume operations when new safety guidelines take effect next month. We felt that putting our users in mortal danger for a quick buck was the right move. Build me an engine that can carry me home Light my darkness, bake my bread Show me the future, keep my family safe and warm Play me a song, make me smile GE, we bring good things to live in We bring good things to life Be there in the morning, show me all there is to see Turn my happy moments into memories bring me closer to the ones I love. GE, we bring good things to live in, we bring good things to life. Japanese engineers are looking to wind power for sustainable clean energy. They've started operating a major wind turbine on a trial basis in southwestern Japan. The turbine is 83 meters wide and stands off the coast of Kitakyushu. It can generate enough electricity to meet the needs of 1,500 households. Officials push the start button to set the turbine in motion. Offshore turbines produce more stable supplies of electricity than land-based wind power. This is because sea winds are stronger and are less affected by topography. We lag behind Europeans in offshore wind power, but we have the technology to win. I hope this project marks the start of Japan's efforts to catch up with and overtake Europe. The engineers will analyze the equipment's durability against salt and waves over the next two years. 
Good evening. NBC News has learned the former number two man in the Joint Chiefs at the Pentagon, a now retired Marine Corps four star general who had a close working relationship with President Obama, is under investigation for leaking a top secret government project, according to legal sources. It was called the Stuxnet virus. It wormed its way into the computers that helped control Iran's nuclear program. It did a lot of damage, but then officials say the leak of its existence to the New York Times did its own damage to U.S. efforts against Iran. At the time of the leak, the president vowed to find the person responsible. Now comes our report tonight. His name is James Cartwright, known to his friends and co-workers as Hoss, his call sign as a fighter pilot. Tonight he is a target of a criminal investigation by the Justice Department into a leak of intelligence. We begin tonight with our national investigative correspondent, Michael Isikoff. General Cartwright was a key member of President Obama's inner circle of national security advisors. But legal sources tell NBC News that Cartwright has been notified he's the target of a Justice Department criminal investigation into a highly sensitive leak about a covert U.S. cyber attack on Iran's nuclear program. My attitude has been zero tolerance for uh, these kinds of uh, leaks. Uh, these are criminal acts when they release information like this. The New York Times last year broke the story that President Obama had secretly ordered a stepped-up cyber weapon attack using a malicious computer virus known as Stuxnet, and that Cartwright conceived and oversaw the special operation from the Pentagon. We're trying to build a second cyber force right now. Cartwright did not respond to requests for comment from NBC News. Contacted today, his lawyer, former Obama White House counsel Gregory Craig, said only, I have no comment. The Times story disclosed key details about the Stuxnet attack, including its code name, Olympic Games, the cooperation of Israeli intelligence, and its success in disabling nearly 1,000 Iranian centrifuges to enrich uranium. This leak was very damaging. Clearly what was going on here was a method, and it should have been protected, and I think it's had devastating consequences. The legal sources say the FBI originally focused on whether the Stuxnet leak came from the White House. But late last year, agents started zeroing in on Cartwright, who had retired from the Pentagon in 2011. The motives of whoever leaked remain a mystery. There are many reasons why people leak classified information. Sometimes it's uh, to attack a program, sometimes it's to defend it. Many times we just never know. White House and Justice Department officials declined to comment on any aspect of the case, but legal sources tell NBC News that federal prosecutors have developed their case without issuing any subpoenas for phone records from the New York Times. The presidents of South Korea and China have met in Beijing. They discussed North Korea at their summit. They agreed dialogue is the best way to resolve the North's nuclear development. Park geun traveled to the Chinese capital for a four-day visit. She signed a joint statement with Xi Jinping. We agreed to work for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, maintain stability, and solve problems through dialogue. The situation on the peninsula is changing for the better. We hope the six-party talks will resume as soon as possible. The two leaders also agreed to boost diplomatic and economic ties. They say they will create a new framework for high-level talks. They also agreed to work for the conclusion of a free trade agreement. A great change is happening in Northeast Asia. President Xi and I share the view that we should create new bilateral relations, a new Korean Peninsula, and a new Northeast Asia in this time of change. More than 70 business people are accompanying Pak. China is South Korea's largest trade partner. The South sends a quarter of its exports to China. South Korean companies need to expand their activities in China to survive the severe economic situation. Chinese and South Korean leaders also want to reduce their reliance on the U.S. and European markets to achieve stable economic growth.